So you're walking down the beach and you're gonna try to pick out the toughest guy in that beach. You look for that chiseled bodybuilder. Is he the one that's always dominant? Chances are no. There's gonna be a scrawny guy who's got the attitude, who's gonna kick sand in his face. The same thing with deer. That's how dominance works in the whitetail herd. This is Deer and Deer Hunting TV. Which bucks are most dominant in the whitetail herd? That's a question that we get a lot here at Deer and Deer Hunting, and I must have fielded that same question dozens of times over the years. It's one that's not easily answered because there's so many prongs to it. In short, what I tell people is the most dominant bucks, they're gonna have one of four things going on. It's gonna be antler size, body size, age, and attitude and I did not list those in order. I actually listed those in reverse order, which is something that trips people up because when you think of a dominant buck, you think of the biggest buck in the woods. Not always the case. Charlie Alshammer taught us this many years ago when he wrote an article called, Big Bucks Aren't Always Bullies. And in fact, a lot of times, the biggest bucks, antler-wise, are the submissive ones in the herd. They grow big by being submissive and because they get better food and better opportunities. Next up would be body size. Those bigger bucks can be bullies because they are bigger, they're more muscular, they've got more strength normally. That is a good trait to have when you're a buck, but that's not always going to dictate dominance. Yes, it will when he's getting in a shoving match or something, he can push his weight around and he's gonna have his way with a lot of deer, but a couple other things are gonna come into play that are gonna trump that deer. So next in line and second on the list is age. With age comes wisdom with humans and animals, especially deer. Those older mature bucks tend to get their way. They tend to be dominant because they find their way, they find their core area that they like, they will run other bucks out of there. Chances are if he's mature, he's gonna be bigger. Chances are if he's mature, he has bigger antlers. So he's gonna have a lot of things going there, those lesser qualities that's gonna allow him to be dominant. But the number one thing that causes dominance in deer is his attitude. And when you think about deer, think about dogs or anything else, dogs a good example. You go and find a litter of pups and you get your pick of the litter, the one that you're gonna take is the one that has the best attitude. And normally with dogs, the number one dog, the alpha dog, is the one that's gonna be most aggressive, is his attitude. He might be the runt, he might not be you know, the biggest dog in the, in the litter, same thing with deer, and you see this time and time again. Those bully bucks are ones with what we'd say are inferior antlers compared to some of those nice majestic 10 and 12 pointers you see running around out there. They might not have the biggest body size, but they're the scrap fighters. They know how to push their way around. They know how to bully other deer. It's all about attitude. In order to better understand just which bucks will rule the rut, we have to gain a deeper understanding of the internal factors that happen as the herd approaches fall. When we start coming into fall, what we're experiencing is shorter and shorter days, longer and longer nights. Um, as we have longer and longer periods of darkness, we have elevated, continuing to rise levels of melatonin production. And this begins to trigger a response in our deer. Um, if we take a look at bucks, what we will see is we will begin to see a slow increase in production of testosterone. Um, that testosterone is slowly rising to prepare that body for the rigors of the rut. Uh, they're going to start to put on um, body mass, you're going to have a thickening in the neck, um, you're going to start to see behavioral changes that is going to lead to increases in scraping. Um, it's going to result in, this is also occurring around the time in September um, when the antlers are, are done hardening. Um, when they're going to shed the velvet, but you're going to see a slow increase and in rise in testosterone until probably late October. And then what we're going to see is we're going to see an incredible surge in testosterone at that time. So rising levels of testosterone are resulting in a preparation of the body 
to be able to compete for breeding opportunities. And then we're going to have a surge in testosterone that's going to result in dramatic behavioral changes and increased aggression that is going to drive that individual to behaviorally support the physical attributes that they've taken on. Large antlers, large body mass, but that surge in testosterone is going to increase aggression and is going to increase their ability to compete for emotionally and behaviorally compete for breeding opportunities. So you're going to have a massive surge in testosterone, but these animals just cannot sustain it. And you're going to start to see condition deteriorate, and condition is going to start to cause testosterone to decline. They've got to get that testosterone level back down to reduce that, those behavioral changes, reduce that aggression, because they, they, they just have to back out of that breeding season. Uh, they cannot sustain that indefinitely. It's going to, cause, it's going to drive them to death. And so you'll see a de massive decrease in testosterone. You're going to see a decrease in condi condition that's driving that. That's ultimately going to result in shedding of, of the antlers following the breeding season. Normally, if we're taking a look at you know, Michigan, Wisconsin, we're seeing that that's resulting in shedding of the antlers beginning around Christmas time. Um, if you get into some parts of the south, that may be, t may be taking place in February or even March. So what's interesting about dominance in deer, what we've learned through research and some of the things that Dr. Dishkoff has learned at Auburn University, is that when everything comes together health-wise for a herd, you're going to see this well-balanced herd. We call it a finely tuned herd. That's where you have a good proportion of bucks and does, the age structure is there, and you're going to have individuals from that herd big antler deer, you know, what we say, you know, inferior antler deer that are all going to be taking part and they all have their place in that hierarchy. And that's something as a hunter and land manager that you need to understand is that it's just not the pretty majestic ones that we're managing for. We're managing for that structure of the herd that every deer within that space is going to play an important role in the herd's health. And that's through dispersal, that's through dominance among male and female members of the herd, and it's also within the sex structure of that herd, buck to doe ratio. Kansas is just one of those special destinations you need to hunt as a whitetail enthusiast. Way more rugged country, more rugged coolies, big oak draws, and big white tails. Now this season, I had a dilemma. Well, I had a Kansas tag. That's not really a dilemma, is it? Nah. But my dilemma was I also drew an Iowa tag. And my Iowa contact was sending me pictures of great bucks too. My plan, hit Kansas first, tag out, and then rush to Iowa to spend the rest of the rut if needed. Now that plan was working perfectly. I was seeing some really good bucks in Kansas, and then HD showed up. Who's HD? Heavy duty. This buck just appeared out of nowhere. He wasn't a summer guest there at Greg's farm. He was a transient buck that just decided Greg's place looked just a little bit better than where he had spent all of his summer. It's on with HD. My buddy Greg was in here this morning scouting and saw no less than three bucks fighting. Now, how do three bucks fight? Well, all three fought together. He got the most awesome footage you've seen. One of those bucks, likely shooter. We're gonna take a look at him tonight up close and personal. But we're gonna have some deer action. We're surrounded by food plots that Greg's just been manicuring all summer long. And the deer are attracted to this one spot. Plus, if you follow me out the window, That's right, we got a decoy here because we are going to have a tough time getting the deer right here to where we want him because there's going to be so many other deer around. 
So we're gonna try to lure him in. There's a fence gap here. He's gotta go through that fence gap. He's gotta go by the buck. He should posture and we should have a great shot. That's if it all comes together. We've all been here before. Your target buck is just out of range. And well, he's taking his sweet time out there. There you go. Closer, closer, further, further, ugh. Well, with limited time away from home and after watching HD disappear into the sunset, Mark decided to slip over to Iowa for a couple of days rather than completely eating that tag. He experiences some decent encounters, but ultimately decides to pass and head back to Kansas at the end of the week in the hope that HD is still stomping around trying to find the doe of his dreams, 20 to 30 yards in front of Mark's blind. Seconds ago, the buck I've been waiting for, for the whole hunt here in Kansas, just appeared right out of the timber here, walked right up. I've got some scents out here. The deer have been hitting this scent mark and they're coming down a fence line. He was headed right to the gap in the gate. He was gonna pass right by the does. And hopefully he was gonna stop him with the scent, but he stopped just before that. I haven't even looked at the video. I'm thinking I had the shot too wide because I'm self-filming here in Kansas. I think you're going to see him uh, right in the corner of the frame and then he runs off. But when he ran off, he ran straight behind me back here and I could see him. He got the old wobbly legs, kind of like I got right now, and he tipped over. I think he's a Kansas brute. My buddy Greg Gilman had videotaped him earlier in the week. The buck has got main beams to no end, mass. I think he's got triple brows on one side, junks off the bases, enormous bases. Maybe we should just go look at him. Oh my goodness! I knew this buck was down. I've been watching him from over in the ground blinds. There's no need to check. I've been watching him for over a half hour to make sure he didn't move after I took the shot. This could be my biggest bow kill whitetail ever. Are you ready? One, two, three, four, five, six. Main beam is seven. One, two, he's got a kicker back here that may or may not go. Three, four, five. Couple kickers down here and below. This base is just enormous. This here is what whitetail bow hunting is all about. Putting all your time in, trying to kill one of these brute bucks, a mature, big, giant buck. I spent a lot of years hunting whitetails. I've been fortunate enough to kill a handful of big ones. This here, he's gonna rival one of my biggest bow kills. I think he's gonna overdo it. In Matthew's Triax, it's been a good year. And you can't, you can't ignore what Kansas has to offer for big white tails. Deer and Deer Hunting is brought to you by Hey, if you're a crossbow hunter, you can appreciate that it's not always as easy as the other guys say it is shooting a crossbow versus a regular bow. We all know that things can go wrong and even the slightest flinch can really affect your accuracy even at the shortest distances. 
I've had it happen to me numerous times. A simple thing that I do is I use the sling. You know, you think of a sling as just something that you're carrying your crossbow into the woods with or to the tree stand with. A sling can be very helpful in helping you stabilize yourself and get that shot off, especially in the event that a deer shows up unexpected, it's right there, you gotta make the shot. You can't get in position to lean up against something or you know, set it on a shelf in a blind or whatnot. So what I do here, it's really super easy, but I adjust that sling before I'm ready to hunt. I have it so it's taut, so I can take my elbow, get it in the sling, and just with my pressure, push my elbow out, rock solid, and just adjust that and use my other elbow, my other shoulder, to balance myself off. You'd be surprised at how much more stable this is rather than just taking the crossbow up and trying to hold it steady. When you do that, a lot of times you squeeze it, you cant it, and you can actually see it, whether you have a crosshair or a pin, you can kind of see it floating. And when we see that, no matter what kind of weapon you're using, you know that your accuracy is going to be affected. Try your sling to stabilize yourself when you're gonna shoot, and you'll be surprised at how much more accurate you can shoot especially at those longer distances. Are you like me in regard to bow hunting? You might have the same arrows for a season or two. You start shooting some, you start breaking them, hitting deer, losing them. And before you know it, you have to get new arrows and you might not buy the same arrows or somebody might give you some different arrows. And if you're like me, you have a quiver or a garage full of all sorts of different arrows. I shoot Easton arrows, and they're all Eastons that I have, but I have a lot of different sizes of arrows. I've learned that at short distances, I can get by with different size arrows that are cut the same, especially on those 15 and 20 yard shots. I don't like to do that, however, because the differences in flight characteristics really show up after that, and especially when you put broadheads on there, even if you're shooting expandables. To illustrate my point, I have two different types of arrows here. I have a six and a half millimeter whiteout arrow, and I have a four millimeter FMJ. If you go off the weight of these arrows, completely different. This one is about eight grains an inch. This one is 11 grains an inch. That's 90 grains difference. Now, that's a lot of weight difference. Now, we're not talking about kinetic energy. We're not talking about any of that. We're just talking about the flight of the arrow. But let me show you the difference on a close shot versus a little bit farther shot. I don't suspect, because I've shot my Matthews enough, I don't suspect much of a difference at the shorter distance, but I expect a big difference at the farther distances. Big difference. And you see that when that arrow flew a lot faster and it hit, I'm gonna guess at least three, three and a half inches higher exact same aiming spot, that's where those differences come into play when you're using various size arrows. So be sure to use the same arrows, practice with them, and by all means when you go hunting, limit your shots to the distance that you know you can hit on the money.